So a few words about our first keynote speaker, Christian Körner. He is a professor emeritus of botan botany at the University of Basel. You have the CVs, short biographies of both speakers in your materials, and I will just highlight a couple of, of uh, 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 elements of the track records. Professor Kerner's uh, scientific work has covered physiological ecology of plants, ecosystems, biodiversity, and climate zones. And he has pioneered CO2 enrichment research in alpine ecosystems and in mature temperate uh, trees, uh, sorry, in mature temperate trees. And he has founded and chaired the Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment Organization. So it's my uh, pleasure now to call you, Professor Kerner. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I feel really privileged to be here, and I thank the Swiss ambassador to facilitate sort of uh, my presence here. I guess this was a bit your role. Uh, and uh, it, is a, it is an amazing point in time. It is half a century since I, as a first year student, was here for the first time. I visited Finland after this, but always in the high north, because I, I had a long tradition of working in the Arctic zone in northern Sweden. So what I'm going to do today is to bring in some biology in full appreciation that you are most likely not biologists in this room, and I will take it, uh, uh, take it easy. Uh, I will avoid jargon as much as I can, but I will have to pull you through some thoughts that biologists came up with, which sort of moderate and relativate some commonplace naive thinking about what nature is doing in response to climatic changes. You have seen this diagram many times, but to me it's still one of the most impressive climatological evidence of our past. What you see in this diagram is the reconstruction of carbon dioxide concentration over the last 800,000 years. Meanwhile, we have arrived at a million years taken from ice cores, a method that was pioneered by Swiss physicists. Hans Oeschke. Now, I show you this diagram because it shows you an up and down. If you count those ups and downs eight times over that period of time, the world went through a warm period and through a cold period. And whenever it was warm, the CO2 concentration was high, and whenever it was cold, the CO2 concentration was very low. This is when Homo sapiens appeared on the scene. So we have gone through as our species to one and a half or two of these cycles. And only 18,000 years ago, the world faced 180 ppm of CO2, which is much less than half of what we have today. And the average, the mean for the last million years was 240. So we really left anything that one can say, it happened already in the recent past that is relevant in terms of evolution. This is just to make the point that we are up there at a concentration that is completely outside what the biota and the climate system has seen. Now, mostly when I talk to the public about uh, climate change effects, they have learned that atmospheric CO2, as it goes up, influences our climate system. And the second talk today will touch upon these issues. But was most people are not aware that CO2 is the food, the staple food of the planet. So there's a direct link. And these plants also get the climate signal. So they get two signals. And it's very hard to tell which of the two signals is more important. I will touch briefly about the direct effect and largely talk about temperature effects. So if there's a lush forest like you have in the southern part of Switzerland and we have in the lowlands of, um, you have in the southern part of Finland and we have in the lowlands of Switzerland, uh, it is warm. So trees get very lush if it's warm. This is our research site with a crane in the forest. But at some point, all these forests reach a limit beyond which trees cannot grow. And you may have passed over this, but we scientists get stuck and we need to find an answer. Because if this edge of the forest over 50 or 20 meters has something to do with warmth, with temperature, 
and the temperature rises, inevitably, that border is going to move. That will be one of my tasks today. I want to draw the link between the Arctic world and the Arctic edge of tree life and the alpine edge of tree life, for instance, in the Alps. And this diagram should remind you that things that we see across elevations are mirroring things that we see along latitude. So that line here marks roughly the limit of tree growth, which is close to three to 4,000 meters in the tropics and may reach sea level at the high north. So there's a correspondence and presumably the same factors, the same drivers, control the limit of tree existence. So why do we talk about trees? Let me remind you that 90% of all living substance on the planet is in the body of trees. So when we talk about carbon and biology and the atmosphere, the only thing we have to talk about are trees and soils, but I will talk about the trees. So there is a limit beyond which trees cannot grow and we call it the alpine. And below that, trees can grow. So the question is, what is causing that limit? Is this a curiosity different in each mountain or is there some common drivers across the world? Well, you may travel the world. In Bolivia, you find the tree limit at 4,800 meters. In New Zealand at 1,200 meters, in Mexico at 4,000 meters, in the Alps at 2,000 meters. And you may wonder, is there anything in common? If I go to northern Sweden, you find the tree limit at 600 meters, or in northern Finland. Alexander von Humboldt had already this vision that there is a global connectivity across the world by mountains. And I modernized his classical diagram, 200, uh, more than 200 years old, and you see the red band is the, what we call the alpine life zone where trees cannot grow for reasons we have to explore now. And the green belt is where trees can grow. So there is a global connectivity from the polar tundras down to Terra del Fuego, where we find similar types of land cover. That is really intriguing. I think it's the only type of landscape that has a global distribution. Now, with this single slide, I try to, to make it clear why trees have a problem where other smaller plants have none. You wonder why you, across the Arctic uh, tree line, you enter the lush north and tundra ecosystems with hundreds of species doing well. Have trees undergone a lousy evolution? Didn't they learn something that other plants have learned? Well, if you look at this image, you see immediately that a tree has a problem when it gets cold. You see that tree, this is, this is temperature. This is nothing else than temperature. You don't see a picture that was colored. All what you see are individually measured temperatures with an infrared camera. So the tree is cold, its shade is cold, and the surrounding low statue vegetation is warm. The difference may be 10, 15 degrees Celsius between the tree and the remaining species. Now, these species engineer their climate by being small. They decouple from wind, from atmospheric circulation, while the tree is standing there and the air is passing through its branches and does not permit the tree to depart from the from the pressure that the air temperature exerts on it. So it, the tree is very close to air temperature. That is the reason why trees cannot cope when it gets cold. When it gets cold, you need to become small by design. I took one slide from the northern part of Finland and Norway where we had a project where we studied these temperatures and I just can summarize. Small plants beyond the tree line live in a world that you cannot describe by weather station data. The difference may be as much as 2,000 kilometers of latitude or thousand, well, one or two kilometers of elevation. Because these plants do uh, air conditioning, they, they are small and they prevent the air to exchange with the atmosphere when the sun shines. You see it's very warm here high up in the Arctic. I explored the question whether these trees at this line around the globe have something in common which is related to temperature. And 
actually, what I found is that in all these places, from Borneo to New Zealand and to, to the temperate zone, a seasonal mean temperature of 6.4 degrees C is wherever trees find the limit, from the tropics to the polar tree line in northern Sweden. So we are facing a situation where we have a line that is globally tied to what we call an isotherm, a line of similar temperature across the globe. And so if the climate is warming, and if that isotherm is moving up slope, so will the tree line. We call it the tree line, not a tree species line. All species have a limit somewhere, but this is a life form limit, irrespective of species. Whether it's a betula, a birch in northern Sweden, or whether it's a tea tree in, in, in Borneo, it's always the same temperature. And there are other such limits for other species as you go up the mountain. What happens now is that humans have cleared many of these boreal, arctic and alpine forests for land use. These areas are now filling with the green area, but there are certain areas that will always stay free of trees. These are, for instance, avalanche tracks. So the move is on the way. These trees are already recognizing that over the last 100 years in Switzerland, we have seen a 2 Kelvin warming. Globally, we have seen nearly, we will hear more about it, 1 Kelvin of warming. So they are on the way, but for becoming a tree from a tiny seedling and a shrubby life form, it may take 50 years. So there's a lag in visibility. I took this diagram from a Russian group which illustrates that this is a phenomenon that happens globally. This is the Arctic forest edge in the northern Ural, and you see a picture from 1961 compared to one from 2003, and it's quite obvious. The forest got more dense and the trees got bigger. Now, I talked about the tree line. This is where no tree can grow beyond. But all the species that we have globally have somewhere a limit, even Homo sapiens. Imagine no clothes, no heating, no houses. Where would be our limit? Certainly not in Finland, probably not in Switzerland. All organisms have a life territory and an edge. All organisms banana trees, apple trees. And so as you move up a forest like here in Kuh, near Kuh in Switzerland, you find limits of trees that never reach the tree line, but they all have their limits. They all need to move if temperature is the key factor. And I will explore these briefly. Finland has one of the northest positions of oak trees. So these oaks, if they have a temperature limit, they will move as well. And let me briefly explore this. What is it that controls tree growth? To understand this, we really need to understand phenology. And I'm not sure whether you have ever heard that word. I need to explain it. Meteorologists know it, but uh, the lay people have maybe not known it. It's a visible change of appearance of plants. There are lots of changes that we don't see. But some of the changes, like flowering, bud break, leafing, autumn color, we can see. And we call this phenos, phenology. And that's tied somehow to the climate. And some people think uh, phenology is something that works like a thermometer. So when it gets warmer, the tree do every, trees do everything earlier. But that's a naive perspective. Because trees do not only respond to the external environment, but they have an internal setting that prevents them from doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Maybe not so much in Finland, but in Switzerland we have these fern winds. You can have 22 degrees on a, on a veranda in February, people drinking coffee outside when the fern winds go through, and a week later we have minus 10 degrees. So if a tree would take that warming that the curiosity of weather is producing serious, the next thing would be killing. So there is an internal insurance that makes trees susceptible to warming only when the time is right. That is an insurance risk calculation. When is the risk minimum that I can allow to open my buds? The problem, of course, is if you do this, 
it's not a certain, it's not one factor, it's not temperature, there must be something else, and it most likely is the day length. Day length is an astronomic clock, and the astronomic clock tells these buds, hey, wait, this is, this is just weather stupidity, this is not really something uh, that uh, you should take serious. S some like this don't have this, they just go by temperature, they are real thermometers. These like hornbeam, they wait that the cold period has passed because that's the only thing they know that it's not autumn but spring. They need to know that winter has gone, otherwise they would flush in autumn. But these ones, and this is relevant for most Nordic species, they have a triple security. They take temperature serious only after cold temperatures told their genome the cold is behind, plus the date is correct, and they know the date by one or two days. So all these trees have an internal calendar. They know today is 18th of March. Whatever the temperature in Helsinki, don't take it serious. It's still not the right time. A polar front statistically may come in, and evolution makes statistics over 100,000 of years. So they have a memory. They know what is appropriate, because if they don't behave properly, they're gone. So why is phenology so fundamental for life. Most people are not aware that phenology means synchrony. That's the only thing you need to achieve, not the only, but the most important one, to have sexual reproduction. So flowers on the meadow, flowering in the forest, they must occur on the same day in the same week. If they're out of phase, the genes can fly wherever they go, they will not make any offspring. So it's so fundamental, it's actually more fundamental than photosynthesis or something else. It's the most fundamental thing that, in evolution that species reproduce, and therefore they need to be ready at the same time. And the second is it allows plants to escape the curiosity of weather, which is not climate, and escape, for instance, from freezing, which means survive. So freezing resistance goes, is not a constant. I cannot say a birch outside the, the, this, this street has a certain freezing tolerance, because that freezing tolerance changes. A birch may survive minus 80, 80 minus not 18, 80 degree in winter, and it may be killed by minus 5 degree in spring. So there's a seasonal course. That's the first thing. It's not a constant. You have to measure it. And then we use experiments. That's the only picture I show about experiments, where we freeze plants with a certain program, hold them at a certain temperature, and then bring them back in computer-controlled freezers. And then we know which temperature is killing that tissue. And I show a single diagram, a scientific diagram, I dare to do it, and that's a simple one. If you follow me, you will understand it. This has two axes. One axis shows the freezing tolerance, minus 10, minus 5. Oh no, these are two diagrams, sorry. This goes from 0 to minus 15, and from 0 to minus 15 twice, because it goes for leaves and for buds. And here is the date when they open the bud. Calendar date is converted in a continuous number. So there is April, around April, May. So what you can see in this diagram, those species that have inherited a high freezing tolerance so they can survive low temperatures, they open their buds earlier. And those that open their buds late, they have a low freezing tolerance. So phenology and freezing tolerance is interlinked and that makes it so difficult also to understand for the public that trees don't just follow temperature. They have a rucksack, they have a bag of evolutionary developed freezing resistance and this photoperiod control that allows them to open only when it's safe. Safe in terms of outside conditions, but safe in terms of their internal ability to cope with freezing. So, the limit of trees, and that's the topic of today, is controlled by three factors, not just by temperature only, and that makes things so complicated. The first is, plants need to have a certain freezing tolerance. They need to survive certain critical temperatures. If they don't, they go. Second, they need to have an internal clock that tells them when the time is right to go, to start. But the problem is, if you're an insurance company and you always go for the absolute safety, 
That means there's no time left because you would start flushing in July. And there may still be a late frost in June. So this is a trade-off between what am I losing, what am I gaining? So the remaining time of the season is also an important factor because you need to finish your job, you need to finish your twigs, your leaves, your buds, you need to get ready for the next winter. So if you want to be 100% sure, you're late and later and later, and then you lost time to mature your tissue and you're killed by the next freezing and winter. So this is a, a very complicated interaction, but I want to make you aware that this is not just a temperature thermometer response of these forests, it's very, very complicated. So when the trees move up there, they have to do all these calculations. But there's a question. Would in addition to temperature, perhaps carbon be a limiting resource? You know, plants take up carbon from the atmosphere. This is the planet Earth. And if you take all the carbon dioxide together, carbon is coal, diamonds, and you make a little layer of coal dust on the globe, it would cover the globe with a layer of 1.5 millimeter. Remember, this is the staple food of the planet. We're all living on this. My tie is made of that carbon. All what we ate over lunch comes from there. So it's not just a pollutant. It's the number one food for the planet. So people have been thinking, could more CO2, while it makes the climate crazy, also have some benefits for trees eating more? Well, this is much of my research, and I will allow only five slides, and then we pass over this. All this carbon dioxide goes into those leaves by these little pores that we call stomata. So leaves suck CO2. But remember, we have now 410 ppm, and they survived all 180 ppm only 18,000 years ago, which is peanuts. This is a very basic slide. I guess everybody who has still some memory on school has learned the same lesson as I did. Photosynthesis of leaves drives plant growth. I'm so sorry that this is wrong and all school books are wrong. <laughs> there's, there's no question there will be no growth without photosynthesis. But an economist would ask the question in a different way, because this is a supply. And for a supply to go somewhere, you need a demand. If there's no market for your shoes, you can produce as many shoes as you want. So you need both. You need somewhere to put it, and you need somewhere to produce it. And there's a balance. And we all learned the function goes in this way. The sugar is produced by photosynthesis and transformed into starch and cellulose, and goes there, and if there's enough, the tree will grow. Hey, are trees, is lettuce, are potatoes just made of carbon? Is there something else? Of course, there are nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, manganese, molybdenum. Blah, 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 blah. If some of you had no selenium in this body, you would not be sitting here. So there's a whole spectrum of chemical elements that don't fall from the sky. They need to be in the soil. And only when they and the temperature and the water permit the tree to grow, he says, hey guys, we need some sugar. So that machinery must be there, but it operates under control of the market, which is, we call it the sink, which is gross. So over the last years, I made a strong case, and the scientific community is slowly getting into this, that in most cases, except if you fertilize and water and warm, the gross is controlling the rate of photosynthesis on demand. Whoever has a finger in business will understand this, but biologists are bad in business. So I talked about this at MIT in Washington, and the economist and engineer understood immediately. But biologists have a problem with sink and source and market and investment. And so that's the machinery we built to confirm politicians who would not believe that CO2 is not a fertilizer to the globe. It's a huge thing. We were the first worldwide who enriched entire big trees with CO2 like a future scenario in 100 years. We used these spruce trees and uh, beech trees and we released tons every day, two tons of CO2 that is on food quality, it's industrial waste, so we didn't add anything, we just bought clean CO2 from industrial waste. And the net outcome is no effect, absolutely zero. This was before the treatment, this was after the treatment, and whether in the top of the tree, in the middle, in the bottom, there's just a bit of variation, but there's no signal. That's what you would predict. That is what you predict when you agree that it needs other things than carbon to grow. 
to grow. And this is a fundamental slide. I put in a quotation mark. So uh, to the students, I say, if I can tattoo in your brain, this is a tattoo for your brain. The carbon cycle is a consequence of the nutrient cycle. So only the, the, the nutrients permit trees to become a sink, trees to take up carbon. And since there's no rain of phosphate, no rain of potassium, there cannot be by theory and by experiment any CO2 fertilization effect that makes politicians believe, yeah, CO2 is bad for the climate, but it's good for the plant because they have more food. I say, stop. Carbon is not a staple food by itself. You need other things. Very important message. So when trees grow rings, we know that we are living in a carbon-saturated world. All these carbon fertilization stories are illusions from modelers who have not gotten the first-class introduction to the carbon and nutrient cycle. They all think photosynthesis is faster, so the forest should grow more, and if they grow more, they should store more. It both is nonsense. And the facts, we have four worldwide, only four experiments out of thousands, who treated unfertilized natural trees in situ. One is in Umea, in Flakaliden, by Sune Linde, in Sweden. Two in Switzerland, one in Australia. That's it. All the rest is crops, is nursery trees, is fertile agricultural land, young trees which are in an exploding stage. That's the reality. So, when these trees grow, I show you pictures of where they grow. When I mean grow, I mean building a new cell, building a new tissue. That is where the tree ring is formed. That is a scanning electron micrograph of a bud where the new branch is formed. These environmental factors like temperature, water, nutrients, they all act directly on these tissues. And only if they facilitate growth, then they will say, okay, bring some carbon, bring some sugar, then we grow. So forests in the wild are not carbon limited. But should they grow faster? And there's evidence that they do. There's a better Pekka Kaupi, I think, from Helsinki. He showed that the entire boreal forest grew faster. We showed that the Swiss forests at the upper edge, they grow faster. Most likely, this is a direct facilitation of growth by the warming climate. If they do, some people take it as a given that they also will store more. And an economist would never make that claim, because that means confusing a rate with a pool. Growth is a rate, is a process by which carbon is incorporated, and you need to have uptake and loss. And the balance is this defined by the residence time. I wrote that note in science that caused many people to, to start thinking in this direction. Now, uh, modelers are really taking this issue of residence time up. So you cannot predict storage from how fast trees grow. So, what can be done with trees if we want to mitigate these environmental problems of climate change? Well, you can produce more forest, but you have to sacrifice land for this. This can be agricultural land, urban areas, industrial land. You need to have the land. And you can thicken the forests, but you can do it only once. Once the forest reached its maximum, it will turn over. So that's, there's not much you can do. Switzerland had done the maximum. You know why? Not because the Swiss are very greenish, because the salary of the forest workers is too high. They import from Finland and from Russia and from Germany, where the salaries are lower. That's why the stocking of the Swiss and the Luxembourg forests have a European maximum. And if a storm Lothar comes in, it can flatten in one hour um, three annual harvests of these old forests, because old forests resist less to storms than young forests. The second thing is you can replace biomass. And I think both Switzerland and Finland do a lot in this respect. I studied the trade statistics of Switzerland and Finland, and I saw Finland is always in the first three or four positions of the countries from where Switzerland imports. That includes even fuel wood pellets, and 1.2 million tons of paper comes from Finnish sources to Switzerland. It's quite impressive. I didn't know that. So when we want to tackle this problem, forests are not going to be a big help. Fossil CO2 released by society 
is hardly absorbed by forests because we cannot expand them, we rather cut them down worldwide. But timber products, as a substitute for fossil products, they can do a job, but we should not be naive and over-optimistic. So my last slide is, yes, these forests are going to move slower or faster, depending on lots of other things. And as they expand uphill or to the north, they will cover new land, which covers and stores a little bit of extra carbon. But as the remote sensing climatologist will confirm, the ref solar, solar reflection goes down. If you have snow, there's a lot of solar energy reflected. If you have trees, it's absorbed. So that extra carbon that goes into that expanding forest may have a trade-off in f allowing more warming to the atmosphere because the reflection that we call albedo is going down. That's an issue for you. I thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Körner. Now we go immediately over to uh, Professor Talas.